Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of the listeners from around the world. It is currently seven o'clock in the morning here in Philadelphia, and I have no financial disclosures. And I have to tell the, I am not able to move my screen again. Uh, give me one second. Yes. Uh, I think you need to move the arrow into the screen and press. Got it. Thank you. Okay. There you are. So this morning or this afternoon or this evening, I'd like to talk to you on a topic near and dear to my heart, conjunctival tumors in a nutshell. Back in 2017 in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, we published a large review on conjunctival tumors in over 5,000 cases. And if we look at this, we compared benign versus malignant counterparts. We found that conjunctival tumors were benign in over 50% of cases, pre-malignant in 18%, and malignant in 30% of cases. But what are the specific diagnoses? And you should keep in mind, this series came from an ocular oncology center, so it may be weighted more towards pre-malignant and malignant tumors. The list is long, going from chorostomatous to benign epithelial to pre-malignant and malignant epithelial tumors, melanocytic, vascular, and on and on, even down to myxomatous, lipomatous, lymphoid tumors, and simulating lesions. I won't go into all of those. I'm just going to talk mainly about the big three. Ocular surface squamous neoplasia, which was found in 14% of our series. Melanoma, 12% of the series. And lymphoma, 7% of the series. These represent 33% or one third of all conjunctival tumors. But there are some precursors or simulators that can simulate the big three, such as papilloma, which is rare, nevus, which is common, primary acquired melanosis, and benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. These represent 38% in our series. So if you combine all of these together, we will have the first two as epithelial, ocular surface squamous neoplasia and papilloma. The next three as melanocytic, melanoma, nevus, and primary acquired melanosis. And then the last two as lymphoid, including lymphoma and benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. If we can remember these seven subsets or diagnoses, we will understand over 70% of conjunctival tumors, because these are the big players when it comes to conjunctival tumors. Let's first begin with the epithelial tumors. Ocular surface squamous neoplasia, otherwise known as OSSN and papilloma. OSSN is really an umbrella term. It describes a spectrum of conjunctival epithelial tumors, from squamous cell carcinoma in situ to squamous cell carcinoma with invasion into the stroma. Both of these can have similar appearance. Squamous neoplasia generally appears as a fleshy vascular mass with feeder vessels, leukoplakia, typically non-pigmented. They can be extensive and they can show invasion into the sclera, into the orbit, and I've even seen it into the brain. So who gets squamous cell carcinoma? Well, in the U.S., it tends to occur in Caucasian older males. 81% of patients that we see with OSSN are males. If we see OSSN in a young patient, we consider risk factors of immunosuppression, like does this patient have HIV or did they have an organ transplant or are they a smoker? And smokers tend to get bilateral OSSN in the inferior fornix, where all the smoking carcinogens finally rest in the inferior fornix. We also occasionally see a patient with xeroderma pigmentosum who 
is at risk for OSSN. Here's an example of a patient <clears throat> lung transplant who had a very small gelatinous OSSN <clears throat> on the surface of the globe. So we have to consider these factors of lung transplantation or other transplants when you see a patient with squamous neoplasia. Here's a patient with a heart transplant. You can see this is a larger, more vascular squamous neoplasia in this patient post-transplant. There's a spectrum of conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma ranging from small to intermediate, gelatinous, larger, multinodular, or even gigantic on the surface of the eye. And these very large ones tend to occur in patients who are immune suppressed or unaware that they may have a tumor on their eye. There's different management options for patients with squamous neoplasia. Basically, it boils down to two, surgical or non-surgical. Let's first talk about surgical. We like to do this in the operating room. We use retrobulbar anesthesia because we do not want to disturb the appearance of the conjunctiva as we see the patient. And then we will take the entire tumor off using what's called no-touch surgery. Now you have to look at these patients in the office very carefully because in the office you might say, well, that's the tumor there, but not so. The tumor is much larger. You might say, well, maybe that's the tumor there, but we're missing little parts, you know, little flat component on the cornea and maybe the peripheral wing. This is what we would consider the tumor when we went into the operating room. So I show you here a case of a squamous neoplasia at the limbus before, and you can see that we first start out with corneal epithelial keratectomy. We only remove the epithelium. We do not disturb Bowman's membrane. We apply absolute alcohol. We carefully scroll the epithelium off Bowman's membrane with care to never make a cut in Bowman's membrane. Next, never touching the tumor, we make an incision into the conjunctiva about two millimeters outside the tumor. Then we remove the tumor. Then we move on to cryotherapy surrounding the tumor. And you can see this case before and after treatment, this patient healed nicely. Not all patients heal so well. Some will have a little pseudoterygium. But here I'll show you the, the surgery of how we do surgical removal of squamous neoplasia. <clears throat> we have two main rules. Number one, no one's allowed to squirt BSS because we don't want to shed any cells. And number two, no one's allowed to touch the tumor. We call this no touch surgery. So we start our surgery, you'll see here in the video, by applying absolute alcohol to the epithelium and then carefully scrolling the epithelium off onto the tumor cauterizing feeder vessels, making our incision down to bare sclera, cauterizing more vessels, taking it tenons off all the way to bare, bare sclera. You can see us cauterizing here. And then we're holding normal tissue and shaving this off the limbus, never touching the tumor. The tumor is placed on a sh sheet of cardboard and submitted to pathology. We clean up the base. We apply alcohol to the base and carefully take off cells, and then we close after cryotherapy. We do double layer closure. First, we close tenon's fascia, and next we close the conj epithelium. We like to apply tissue glue to all of our patients who have conj tumor surgery because we think that keeps them comfortable and it allows them not to feel their sutures. So here you see the same patient before, and then two to three weeks after surgery. You can see the, the sutures are still somewhat in place. We have a nice limbal structure and the corneal epithelium's intact. Here's another patient with feeder vessels, a gelatinous squamous neoplasia before and after surgical resection. This is what we see in most patients. We have a little bit of a, what we call iatrogenic pterygium that forms due to stem cell loss at the site of surgery. Now let's look at OSSN worldwide, not just what we see in the States. This is a wonderful study done by Steve Gichui. 
this study came from Kenya. Uh, and, and he wrote this in concert with a team at Moorfields in London, England. And what they did was they looked at the prevalence of squamous neoplasia all over the world. Blue circles mean male, purple circles mean female. And if you look at this, you'll note in the northern continents, North America, Europe, and in Australia, most squamous neoplasia occurs in males, and it's with a fairly low frequency. However, if you look in southern areas like South America and Africa, squamous, ocular surface squamous neoplasia occurs almost equally in males and females and with a much greater frequency. So if we look at Africa and we go back and look over the years, the incidence of squamous neoplasia was only two to three per million from the 1970s to the 1980s. Then in 1989, something happened and that was the HIV pandemic. And that's when OSSN had a dramatic rise from two to 27 cases per million. So it's important to keep that in mind. Patients who are immunosuppressed, especially HIV patients, are at moderately high risk for OSSN. The other thing to keep in mind is the diagnosis. What looks like OSSN may not be OSSN. Let's look at a few cases. This patient was sent into our practice with OSSN, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. I thought, yeah, it looks like it. There's this gelatinous limbal mass, but if you look up here, there's a little bit of pigmentation. Now, pigmentation can be seen with OSSN, but this pigmentation proved to be PAM, primary acquired melanosis, which is a precursor for melanoma. So this was PAM associated with amelanotic melanoma. This would not have responded to usual topical therapies that, we, that I'll speak about in a few minutes for OSSN. Conjunctival melanoma is much more serious than OSSN. Well, here's another patient who was sent in to see us. He was Hispanic, and he was sent in with a diagnosis of melanoma. And if you look at this, it looks like it's really invading the epithelium, very irregular surface with vessels into the epithelium. Well, we surgically removed that, and it proved to be pigmented conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this can be seen in patients of intermediate and darker complexion. The squamous neoplasia can become pigmented because of pigmentary cells, melanocytes, that are called fellow travelers that get trapped in the squamous neoplasia. This is much more commonly seen in Africa. Well, here's a patient of intermediate complexion, and she was referred in with a diagnosis of melanoma. And we did uh, an anterior segment OCT on her. And let's look at this. That's the lesion right there. And let's expand that lesion. And you can see in that lesion, there were cysts. And cysts are not generally seen with melanoma. They're, it's far more suggestive of a nevus. So we surgically removed that pigmented lesion and it proved to be a nevus, not melanoma, a nevus with cysts. And last, a patient I just saw this week. It was a telehealth male consult from Alaska in the United States. And this was a 70-year-old patient. And the doctor said he has this papilloma. This is the second or third time it's come back. Now let's look at it a little more closely. It's a gelatinous lesion. I know the picture's not good. He took it with his cell phone. There's feeder vessels, it's at the limbus, and the gentleman is 70 years old. It's far more common for that to be a squamous neoplasia rather than a simple papilloma. I told his doctor to start him on topical drops. I told him to start him on topical 5-fluorouracil to treat this squamous neoplasia uh, to avoid surgery uh, just because he was so far from Philadelphia. So this was OSSN in a 70-year-old male. And last, perhaps one of the most serious mistaken diagnosis is this one. This patient came to see us from Chicago in the United States with ocular surface squamous neoplasia of the tarsal conjunctiva. 
we took one look at that and we said, that's a really odd place to get squamous neoplasia on the tarsal conjunctiva. We did a biopsy and it proved to be sebaceous carcinoma, much more serious. You can't treat this with topical. You have to treat this with posterior lamellar resection of the eyelid. So what we did was we resected the entire posterior lamella by making an incision above the lashes and taking out the whole posterior component of the upper eyelid. You can see us removing it here and then reconstructing with buccal graft from the mouth. Far more serious disease than squamous neoplasia. So we've talked about surgery for squamous neoplasia. Now let's talk about the non-surgical methods because these are actually very popular. We have topical mitomycin C. This used to be the most commonly used. Now in our hands, it's the least commonly used. It's too toxic. It's used for one month. It causes limbal stem cell loss. And later you have the stem cell repair costs. So we hardly ever use it. Next is topical 5-FU. Well, this is quickly becoming a favorite drop. It, it's used for one month. We generally use it for one week. Mitomice, uh, 5-FU, 1% QID for one week on, then three weeks off. It's a little bit toxic, but it's not expensive, and patients tolerate it well. Interferon, well, this happens to be our favorite drop. It works very slowly. It takes three to six months. It's non-toxic. Patients are to totally comfortable when they're on it. It has minimal complications. And sometimes if there's large disease, giant squamous neoplasia, we will give injection of interferon once a month for four months. It causes the patient to feel, feel flu-like for one day, um, but it has minimal complications. Photodynamic therapy is rarely used. We you know, it's a one-day treatment. We only use if the patient has failed all of the above. But we do have a strong preference for interferon because of the comfort level for the patient. So here's a patient with a translucent OSSN on the cornea that was treated with topical interferon for one or two weeks, and the tumor completely resolved. So interferon is, and the patient had no complications. Years ago, we published on interferon for ocular surface squamous neoplasia in 81 cases. Basically, interferon can be used as immunotherapy, immunoreduction, and immunoprevention. So what do we mean immunotherapy? Well, this first paper is on interferon as immunotherapy in 23 cases. Basically, if you use interferon topical or injection, there's about an 80% chance or better that the squamous neoplasia will resolve with immunotherapy alone. What do we mean by immunoreduction? Well, immunoreduction is when we use topical or injection interferon to shrink a giant ocular surface squamous neoplasia. I mean, these are tumors that are on average 20 millimeters in diameter, and it can reduce the mass by at least 75%. So then you can reset the remnant. We, we like to use injections because we know the patient's getting the medication. I generally give one cc, which is 10 million units, and I just balloon up the OSSN on the surface of the eye and then watch the tumor melt away. Here's the patient in, in plate D. He had extensive. Here he is. I outline his OSSN. It's extensive. The whole top half of the bulbar conjunctiva is affected with OSSN. After a few injections, you can see it's all regressed and he's left with a little remnant that I can easily resect. Another case with giant OSSN, we, you can see it outlined here, following injections and topical therapy, the tumor is completely resolved. And another with giant OSSN involving the entire inferior fornicial conjunctiva, Bulbar, fornix, and tarsus, following injections and topical therapy for two, three, or four months, the tumor is completely resolved. So interferon is a powerful medication for treating large tumors. Now, we can also use immunointerferon as immunoprevention, especially in our patients who are organ transplant 
HIV, or those who have zero derma pigmentosum, where we give them one drop twice daily for life if they've had multiple recurrent squamous neoplasia. Here's one such patient, the heart transplant patient. We resected this, but then he received a drop of interferon once a day, and he's never had recurrence since we did his resection. We like to prove that there's a risk for recurrence first, and then we give this lifelong. You can't do that with any of the other topical therapies. You can't do topical 5-FU or topical mitomycin C for life. That is a very dangerous therapy that will melt the conjunctiva, melt the sclera, and create a hole in the wall of the eye. Now, we even use immunoprevention for patients who have recurrent papillomas or squamous neoplasia in the socket following enucleation. We have found that this works too. Now, we're coming out with a new publication on primary treatment of ocular surface squamous neoplasia with interferon based on the American Joint Committee on Cancer classification. Basically, we asked the question, is topical interferon more effective for different stages of OSSN based on the AJCC classification? And we looked at 64 consecutive eyes that received eye drops of interferon only. And we compared and we found these, we found that IFFN provides satisfactory tumor control despite the AJCC group. And this is really important. So interferon works for TIS, T1, T2, T3, or even T4. So here we see a T3, which is classified as tumor involving the cornea. And that's before, and this is after topical interferon eye drops only. Note, there are no complications, the patient was comfortable, and after three months, the tumor's completely resolved. Here's another patient who had T4. She has early orbital involvement. I have to admit, we used topical interferon, and we also gave three injections of interferon underneath this tumor. Here she is before, and here she is after four months. The tumor is 98% resolved. We have a little remnant here in the fornix. So when do we use topicals versus surgery? Well, we like the topicals if the patient refuses surgery or if the patient's too elderly and medically unstable for surgery, or if the patient really doesn't want to have any pain, interferon is painless. But you have to understand these topical therapies require the patient to purchase the drops. Often insurance doesn't cover it. You have to trust that they're gonna put the drops in and we always ask for the drops back, especially mitomycin C and 5-FU because these are toxic drops. Interferon takes three to six months. So this really requires patient compliance. And this cost impact is important. One bottle of interferon costs $300, mitomycin C $150, and 5-FU $50, at least in the US. We still like to do surgery on these patients because surgery, number one, establishes the correct diagnosis. Number two, it provides complete control and it helps you to identify, and Dr. Maktabi will confirm this, aggressive variants of squamous neoplasia spindle cell carcinoma and mucoepidermoid carcinoma that might not respond to topical therapy. And it also it establishes if there's deep invasion and it only takes 15 minutes, not three to six months. And you don't have to rely on the patient and it's covered by insurance. So we tend to use surgery as our first alternative. And then if the patient gets recurrence, we'll use topical therapies. But a lot of this depends on the patient's wants and needs. Now, a nice, a nice evaluation came out of uh, Carol Karp's uh, group at Baskin Palmer. They looked at the comparison of surgical versus topical treatment of OSSN, looked at the cost. It was a matched comparative analysis. They compared topical versus topical in injection interferon versus surgery for OSSN, and they found the cost was equivalent 2,800 versus 3,500. US dollars. Interferon required two more office visits. 
surgical treatment might be more expensive, but it was non-significant. Then they took that same cohort, surgical versus medical treatment of OSSN, match comparative analysis to look at recurrence rate. And they found the one-year recurrence rate was nearly identical, looking at topical and injection versus surgery for OSSN. And the side effects were the same. So there's really no benefit of one over the other. So what do we do when squamous cell carcinoma invades into the wall of the eye, like the cornea and the sclera? How do we treat this? Well, basically we remove, remove the tumor and then we irradiate with plaque radiotherapy. Here's the patient after treatment. And if you look at the patient before and then after, you can see the resolution of the tumor. In fact, this patient maintained 2030 vision at six years follow-up and never had further recurrence. Back in the old days, we would have enucleated this eye. Nowadays, we almost never have to enucleate an eye with scleral or corneal invasive squamous neoplasia. You can see the intersegment OCT before showing the invasion into the cornea and then after with near complete resolution of the invasion. So we've talked about OSSN, I've said a lot. I'm gonna go through the remainder relatively quickly. I'm just gonna say a few words about papilloma. Papilloma can occur at any age, nine-year-old, 11-year-old, notice it's in the caruncle where it loves to grow in both of these cases. Here it is at the limbus in a 45-year-old and in the inferior fornix in a 43-year-old. There are over 100 types of HPV virus. Type 6 and 11 are co called the common papilloma virus or warts of the skin, the genital tract, and the conjunctiva. It's types 16 and 18, which can lead to carcinoma. I like to think of them as the teenagers. You know, teenagers get into trouble. 16 and 18 can lead to carcinoma of the cervix and carcinoma of the conjunctiva. This is so important that with cervical cancer, gynecologists now will do a swab for HPV 16 and 18 because it's more predictive of the risk for cervical cancer than a standard pap test. Interesting, huh? Well, we have many different treatments for conjunctival papilloma. This is a patient who was immunosuppressed with a fornicial papilloma. I still like to use interferon. If I do resection, I often will follow it with interferon. And here's one nice case study from India on the use of interferon. This is a young child who had multiple conjunctival papillomas. They gave topical interferon uh, to the surface of the eye and it really didn't work that well until they started injecting. So they injected interferon every two weeks, and you can see how the tumor beautifully responded, and this child had no recurrence uh, following that successful treatment. Another medication that we use for papillomas is Tagamet, cimetidine. And here's the case in point. Cimetidine is commonly used by dermatologists to treat skin warts caused by papillomavirus and we've used it to treat conjunctival papillomas. This young boy had eight previous surgeries by an outside doctor and he kept having recurrence. So we put him on topical, we put him on oral cimetidine, Tagamet, and all of his tumors went away. Now, how does that work? Cimetidine is a histamine two blocker and it actually boosts the immune system. So it allows the, the body to fight the papillomavirus. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about melanocytic tumors. There are th three basic types. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good would be nevus. The bad would be primary acquired melanosis. And the ugly would be melanoma. And there's a lot coming out on melanoma that I'll share with you. Let's start out by just talking about nevus. Conjunctival nevi are common. They have cysts in 65% of cases. They're pigmented in 85% of cases. So keep in mind, they might be non-pigmented when you see them. Here we see a small nevus at the limbus. They tend to occur at the limbus on the bulbar conjunctiva in 72% of cases. They can occur in the caruncle or in the plica. 
when they're on the ball bar conjunctiva, they're almost always immediately adjacent to the limbus. Now beware those that occur in the fornix, the tarsus, or on the cornea. That's very rare, and that's probably primary acquired melanosis or melanoma. Here's a relatively amelanotic nevus right there with cysts that grew into a melanoma right there. It only took one year for that to grow from nevus to melanoma. The transformation rate of nevus into melanoma is estimated at one in 300. Now, not all nevi transform that fast. Here's a cell phone picture that a patient sent to us, and this is the lesion, and that took 20 years to grow from nevus to melanoma. So it can, take a, it can be a very long process. And remember, not everything is a nevus. This is a man sent in to see us. He had a little bit of pigment right there on his plica semilunaris right eye. But if you look at him and lift the lid, you're going to see, you flip the lid, he has tarsal pigmentation. That was melanoma, not a nevus. Let's say a few words about primary acquired melanosis. <clears throat> this is a condition that tends to be unilateral and occurs in middle age, Caucasian and non-Caucasian patients. It tends to be flat and it has no cysts and it carries a very real risk for melanoma. The Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and Wills Eye Hospital have provided large series. Well, Wills Eye, we've provided a very large series of over 300 patients where we studied primary acquired melanosis. We found overall the rate for this to transform into melanoma is somewhere between 9 and 32%. If, the, if a biopsy is done and the pathologist says there's no atypia, the rate is 0%. But if there is atypia, the rate increases. In our series, it was 13%, but in the AFIP series, it was nearly 50%. Now, we studied 311 eyes, and we looked at the rate of PAM transformation into melanoma at 10 years. Overall, it was about 12% if no atypia, 0%, if severe atypia, 13%. Now, can we clinically predict which PAM, primary acquired melanosis, will transform into melanoma? And the answer is yes. We did a multivariate analysis and we found that the more PAM you have, the greater the risk for melanoma. So each clock hour of PAM adds a 1.7 relative risk for melanoma. So that's important to know. So a patient who has one clock hour of melanosis, we can't tell if this is racial melanosis or primary acquired melanosis, Look, just looking at it, we would just watch that. But if a patient comes in and they have this seven clock hours of primary acquired melanosis, that patient has a 12 times greater risk, seven times 1.7 relative risk, 12 times greater risk for melanoma on the side than a patient with one clock hour. So we would treat all of this. And our treatment could be anything from topical mitomycin C to surgical excision and cryotherapy. Now it's important if you see a patient with primary acquired melanosis, look closely. This is a young patient who was sent in with the correct diagnosis, primary acquired melanosis, all over the surface of her conjunctiva and onto the cornea. But you know, in our practice of ocular oncology, we have to inspect everything. So we flipped her lid and we found that the hidden melanoma under her lid arising from the tarsal conjunctiva. So that has to be taken into consideration. Lastly, we'll talk about melanoma <clears throat> as far as melanocytic tumors. Conj melanoma, is it increasing in the United States? And the answer is yes, based on this study by you. And a similar study was done in Finland, and the answer was also yes. The incidence of melanoma is increasing. Rate of exoneration is about 15% at 10 years, and rate of metastasis is about 25% at 10 years. Back in the 1980s, it's estimated that there are about 50 cases of conj melanoma per year in the United States. In the year 2000, it was estimated 200 cases. So the incidence is increasing, and it's estimated two cases per million per year. Conj melanoma originates from primary acquired melanosis in 70% of cases, 
from Nevis in 50% of cases and de novo, that means no precursor in 15% of cases. We always look for PAM. PAM can be so subtle. In fact, in this case, you can see the obvious melanoma, but down here you can see the PAM, and this is what started the melanoma. We looked at over 380 cases looking at, does it matter if the, if the melanoma arises from PAM versus Nevis versus de novo? Does the risk for metastasis and death differ? And the answer is, yes, it matters. If melanoma arises from PAM or Nevis, the rate of metastatic disease at 10 years is only 25%. Whereas if it rises de novo, the rate is double, 50%. That was significant. So de novo melanoma is a more ominous finding. Conjunctival melanoma is most often pigmented as shown here, but it can be completely amelanotic. This lady was, she worked at actually in a doctor's office and it was thought that she may have conjunctivitis and then later thought that she might have squamous neoplasia. But as it turns out, if you look really carefully, she has very subtle primary required melanosis here. And this was an amelanotic melanoma on histopathology. Now I'm gonna ask some questions to the audience. There are six skin types by the Fitzpatrick skin type. This is a dermatology classification, going from light to dark skin pigmentation. What skin type is at greatest risk for skin melanoma? Well, the lightest skin type, they're at the greatest risk. Okay, but the darkest skin type have the worst prognosis because the, melan the skin melanoma is usually detected very late. So let's apply this to conjunctival melanoma. Fitzpatrick skin type. What skin type is at greatest risk for conjunctival melanoma? Well, again, it's the lightest skin type. We call this type one and type two. They're at the greatest risk for conjunctival melanoma. We found in a study that we're just publishing that there's no difference in prognosis based on your Fitzpatrick skin type. So people of darker complexion don't do better or worse when it comes to outcomes. And this will be published in the Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery this year. Conjunctival melanoma outcomes based on the Fitzpatrick skin type in 540 patients. So here's the patients that we had seen with the various skin types. Type one, two, three, darker skin, four, five, and darkest skin, type six. Type five and six are in African-Americans. Every single one of these patients had conjunctival melanoma. And here are their melanomas in all six skin types. And in that study, we found that skin type one and two had the greatest risk for conjunctival melanoma, but all skin types had similar outcomes. Here's another report that's coming out from our service on conjunctival melanoma outcomes based on age. Like who does better, younger or older patients with conjunctival melanoma? And this is Impress. By, by using Kaplan-Meier outcomes, we found older patients had worse vision, more than three lines, three or more lines of vision loss, 64% compared to younger patients, and they had more frequent tumor recurrence, but there was no difference by age in rate of exoneration, lymph node metastasis, systemic metastasis, or death. So age does not matter when it comes to metastatic disease or death. Older people tend to have uh, worse vision and more recurrences. And here's the graph of this. The blue represent the, representing, uh, this group here representing younger patients, 45 years old or younger, 46 to 69 year olds, and greater than 70 year olds. And you can see the blue column represents recurrence, 38% versus 46, versus 70% recurrence in the older patients. Older patients have significantly higher risk for tumor recurrence. And the red and purple representing metastatic disease and death. And you can see METS in red is basically unchanging 
depending upon age, and death, 16%, 14%, 18%, unchanging based on age. And lastly, we're coming out with another report on conjunctival melanoma outcomes based on the AJCC classification. Basically, when we classify melanoma according to the AJCC, anything that's on the bulbar conjunctiva is T1, and anything that's on the tarsal conjunctiva is T2. So T1's bulbar, T2's tarsal. T3 is when it invades the globe, the eyelid, or the orbit, and T4 is when it invades the brain. We never see that. So we only see T1, T2, T3. And if you look at T1 here, T2 and T3, looking at the blue column recurrence, T2 and T3 have substantially more recurrence than T1. And if you look at metastatic disease, which is in yellow, 15%, 53%. So T1, bulbar melanoma, does significantly better than tarsal or invasive into the orbit. And then if we look at death, 8%, 22%, 37%, death increases depending upon your AJCC classification. So what's the management of conjunctival melanoma? It's only surgery. We have no magic eye drops for conjunctival melanoma. It's all surgical management. We do alcohol keratectomy, no touch surgery. And the first surgery is the most important. It's no touch surgery. We avoid tumor seeding. We do not squirt BSS on any of our conjunctival surgeries because this could cause multifocal recurrence and need for exoneration. So here we see a small conjunctival melanoma. This would require complete surgical resection of the tumor, including the corneal component. And here we see the patient following surgical resection with a fairly good cosmetic outcome, a little bit of a iatrogenic pterygium. Here's a large conjunctival melanoma, multinodular, arising from PAM. All of this was surgically removed. Here you can see the video of this. We're applying the absolute alcohol, closing feeder vessels, taking off the cornea, making the excision but never touching the tumor, cauterizing vessels and carefully taking it off. At the limbus, we have the entire tumor off, cryotherapy applied, we open up and close Tenon's fascia. And then in this case, we placed an amniotic membrane and glued it down. And I was worried about this patient's limbal stem cells. Here she is before, here she is after. Somehow her stem cells won the battle and protected her cornea. Four years later, she's doing well with no recurrence. But that was complete excision of an extensive conjunctival melanoma. Now the management of conj melanoma, especially conj melanoma, is more than look and operate. Now we search for molecular biomarkers in every patient. These will identify patients at high risk for melanoma, and we have medications against these biomarkers, just like we do with skin melanoma. Let's just discuss this briefly. The team from Denmark, England, directed by Larson and senior authored by Hegard looked at a retrospective review of conjunctival melanoma based on a biomarker called BRAF mutation. And they found BRAF was a known mutation for skin melanoma, and it was found in 40% of conj melanomas, and it implies poor prognosis. Metastatic disease in patients with BRAF mutation was 32% versus 4% without. And now we have good anti-BRAF medication vemurafenib and dibrafenib. So we looked at the mutational landscape in conjunctival melanoma in 76 consecutive cases on our service, and we found BRAF mutation in 24%, but now we can use medications. These are systemic medications that can prevent metastatic disease. NRAS mutations, we don't have any medications yet. No patient had CKIT mutation. ATRX was the most common mutation that we saw. We have one medication in the pipeline, and NF1 was another very common mutation seen in 42%, and there is investigational drugs. So these drugs, based on biomarkers, we can use to help treat or prevent metastatic disease. And there's one other drug that has come into play big time 
for conjunctival and skin melanoma, and that's checkpoint inhibitors. This is a family of drugs that are designed to protect, to wake up the T cell, because cancer, the cancer cell, the tumor cell, has developed mechanisms to hide from the T cells. And that's this PDL1 ligand that they've designed, that cancer cells have, that cause the T cell to go into sleep mode. And the checkpoint inhibitors block this PDL1 or stimulate the CTL4. Uh, one receptor on the T cell or the PD1 receptor on the T cell and wake up T cells and cause T cells to fight cancer. And some of these medications are medications you've heard of, ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, many of them, av avalumab, and these are very important medications for conjunctival melanoma. The first report came out on pembrolizumab in August 2007 in a patient who had recurrent conjunctival melanoma. This patient had multifocal recurrence in the inferior fornix and at the limbus. The patient was treated only with pembrolizumab, and later they biopsied that black residual mass, and it was complete necrosis. The other, all the tumor resolved just with an IV or an oral medication no surgery. So that was really important. Last, we'll quick, quickly go over the lymphoid tumors of the conjunctiva. How common is lymphoma in general? Well, it's the fourth most common malignancy in the United States, and the incidence is increasing 4% per year. There's two types, nodal and extranodal. Those of us who deal with ocular oncology lymphoma, we deal with specifically extranodal lymphoma in the conj, eyelid, orbit, uvea, vitreous, or retina. Again, in our big study of 5,000 patients, we found lymphoma in the conjunctiva in 9% of cases. So it's a pretty important tumor uh, relative to its incidence in the conjunctiva. Years ago, we looked at conjunctival lymphoid tumors, looking at the risk for systemic lymphoma if the, if the conj lymphoma was the first site, <clears throat> said a different way, if a patient presents to you with conjunctival lymphoma and they have no systemic lymphoma, what is the chance they're going to get systemic lymphoma? Well, we found that if the conj lymphoma was unilateral, they had a 15% risk for systemic lymphoma. And if the conj lymphoma was bilateral, it was a 50% risk. Conj lymphoma tends to occur in the fornix tends to be bilateral. This is, I think, the best published study on conjunctival lymphoma. It was an international multi-center retrospective study coming from Europe. And they divided the conjunctival lymphomas into four different types. Low-grade extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And basically, they took these four different types and studied their frequency. And they found that the most common is extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, then follicular, then diffuse large B cell, and mantle cell. And the five-year survival decreases. These are low-grade lymphomas, the extranodal marginal zone lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, with pretty high five-year survival. And these are high-grade tumors with very low five-year survival down to 9% lymphoma survival with mantle cell lymphoma. So how do we manage uh, conjunctival lymphoma? Surgical resection and radiotherapy if it's localized and chemotherapy if it's systemic. And we really prefer, prefer rituximab, which is a biologic that is specifically designed to attack CD20 on malignant lymphoma cells. Here you can see conjunctival lymphoma before and after surgical resection, looking pretty good with a little symblephron. That is an option but we worry that the lymphoma might come back. We prefer rituximab. This is a patient who had bilateral diffuse conjunctival lymphoma before and after, surge, before and after rituximab. Just four months later, all the tumor was gone. And that rituximab not only cures the lymphoma in the eye, but it also protects them from systemic lymphoma elsewhere. And another patient, just showing you how fast 
rituximab works before and two months after, this large tumor is maybe 80% gone. Now we do provide radiotherapy for conjunctival lymphoid tumors. Um, this is before and after 3000 centigrade. Radiotherapy is very effective for conjunctival lymphoid tumors. There's, there's some new thinking that we might be able to give very low dose radiation. That's called boom, boom radiation. It's only two days, 400 centigrade. And that was first popularized uh, by the Stanford group and others have done it. Boom, boom, four gray versus 24 gray. And it was found that the boom, boom, four gray uh, was effective in, over, in about 80% of patients with only about 20% progressing. So it saves the patients a lot of complications. So in summary, over the past uh, 40 minutes, we've talked about several different important conjunctival tumors. We talked about the epithelial tumors, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, all the great topical medications for that, and we talked about papilloma. Then we moved into the melanocytic tumors, melanoma, nevus, and primary acquired melanosis. Remember, melanoma requires surgical excision. There's no topicals for that. And then we finished up briefly with the lymphoid tumors. We like to treat these with rituximab. Sometimes we use radiation. And if we use radiation, we like to consider super low dose boom boom radiotherapy. For those of you interested in further reading, we have our atlas on intraocular tumors and then atlas on eyelid, conjunctival, and orbital tumor, which reduce all of this. So in summary, this is conjunctival tumors in a nutshell, and I'm open to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Carol Shields. That was very informative, and uh, I, I can say it's a guidelines. Uh, and I would like, uh, I would like first, before, before opening the floor for discussion, to uh, why I cannot share it. Then share screen. Share screen is on the bottom of your yeah. Okay, so uh, first I would like also to apologize for the technical uh, issue that, uh, why is not? There it is. Yeah, and it's never late to talk about our distinguished speaker, Dr. Carol Shields, who is the Director of Ocular Oncology at Service, uh, service at Wills Eye Hospital. She's the Professor of Ophthalmology at Thomas Jefferson University and Consultant at the Children's uh, Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, she is happily married to Dr. Jerry Shields, the founder of the Wills Eye Ocular Oncology with seven children, and uh, she is graduate with honor from the high school. Her journey at Wills Eye Hospital started at uh, uh, residency in 1987, followed by ophthalmic pathology fellowship in 1988. Then she moved to Moorfield, where she had her orbital and eyelid tumor in 1988, and then back to Will's Eye, where she did her Ocular Oncology Fellowship in 1989. Since then, her achievements uh, uh, in Ocular Oncology service has been uh, continuous, and uh, she, it's crowned by more than 1,800 of original articles uh, published in scientific journals, uh, more than 300 textbook chapters, and 11 textbook authors. Uh, also, she presented 860 scientific lectures in different meetings and 60 named lectures. Uh, she is a member in 35 society. And among the uh, 54 uh, prestigious awards she owned, uh, there's a, an 18 most prestigious awards that uh, I know it's sincere to herself. Uh, to her heart, and I will mention a few only for the sake of the time. She is the Byron Henley Award for Top Student Athlete at University of Notre Dame, and this, uh, she is the first woman in the history of the university to receive this awards. She received the Retina Research Award of the Retina Society in October 20, 2006. She is the president of International Society of Ocular Oncology and president of Macular Society. Um, 
the ophthalmology power list is generated every two years, nominated by peers and posted in the journal, The Ophthalmologist. And it list, uh, this list ranks the 100 most influential figures, thought leaders, and opinion shapers of the last year in the field of ophthalmology worldwide. And Dr. Carol Cheese was, was named uh, as one of the top 100 in 2014, named ranked three in, in, in uh, third in 2016 and named 14th in 2018. And it gave me a great pleasure to congratulate her as she was, as she is nominated number one in the power list in 2020. So uh, by this, I would like to open uh, the, the floor for questions and um, Maybe I could start with the yeah. We can open the floor for discussion and questions. I, I see one question here in the Zoom group chat. Should I do do that? Yes, please. Uh, there's a number of questions here. Um, okay, so here's one from uh, Dr. Nanjia to everyone. Uh, what is the site of injection and do you dilute the 10 million international units in drops or saline? So when we use injection of interferon for ocular surface squamous neoplasia, we generally give it in a one cc syringe. It's re we get it from our pharmacy and it has 10 million units in the one cc syringe, and we inject it depending on where the tumor is. If the tumor is 360 on the surface of the eye, we balloon up the whole surface of the eye, just the conjunctiva. If the tumor is only inferiorly, we give the injection only inferiorly. Uh, okay, so here's a hard question. This is from Dr. Vadani to everyone. Uh, would you kindly describe your strategy for sebaceous carcinoma when it's pagetoid uh, on the surface of the eye? So sebaceous carcinoma is one of the most difficult tumors that we deal with. Uh, it generally starts from the upper lid, but it can occur from the lower lid, and it tends to grow th throughout the lid and then grow in, in a pagetoid fashion over the surface of the globe. It does respond to cryotherapy and it responds to topical myotomycin C when it's pagetoid. So we consider that. At the time we do the surgery to remove, remove the main sebaceous carcinoma, we will actually apply cryo, cryotherapy to the surface of the eye after taking MAP biopsies. Often we tell our patients, you may need a cryotherapy treatment, a MAP biopsy and a cryotherapy treatment every six months until we get this totally under control. So it's a, it's a long ongoing process. Here's a question from Dr. Uh, Bijlani. Uh, and Dr. Aza, I would ask um, anytime you wanna answer any of these questions or provide any input, I would appreciate that. Does working outdoors like farmers, policemen, et cetera, carry a higher risk of conch neoplasia? I would say farmers, fishermen, golfers, yes, definite higher risk. I don't know if anyone has looked at job profession as a risk, but I think anyone who works outdoors. I see Maria Monquez from Chile. Maria, do you agree with that? Un unmute yourself. Okay, doctor, okay. Fine. So yes. So I, I do think the profession being outdoors. Okay. Now. Okay. This is from uh, Abdulaziz uh, Al Shamrani. What is your approach in giant conjunctival nevi? Does the ethnicity and extent of clock hours of a giant nevus make a difference? 
Uh, we take so much into consideration when we approach a giant neva. Some of these nevi can actually be 360 degrees all around the surface, on the surface of the eye. Our first approach, if we are convinced it's a giant nevus, would be to simply just watch it and reassure the mother or the family that we can watch it. If the family is a little bit uh, wanting verification, then we'll take map biopsies on all four quadrants and say, okay, we can watch it now. If they want it removed, uh, we can do it in a staged fashion, like remove the top half and then place an amniotic graft or reconstruct and then remove the bottom half. So we do it staged so we don't have such a big defect. And does ethnicity make a difference? Um, not all that much because a, con a giant nevus is a giant nevus no matter if you're, you know, Caucasian or non-Caucasian. So... So now Dr. Maria can answer your question. She can unmute herself, please. Yes, yes. thank you, Dr. Shields. Yes, uh, certainly here in Chile, we have a high UV exposure. So it is very common to see uh, OSSN conditions in uh, very young people, very young patients. So it was surprised for me to see that condition in 30 years old. And I guess that is because of the UV exposure. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, Dr. Carroll, there's a question. If, uh, for how long do we need to apply the absolute alcohol on the cornea and the sclera bed for OSSN? Yes, uh, we apply its absolute alcohol, which means it's 100% alcohol. We have it in a little vial that the nurses open the vial and then they pour it in a little cup and we soak wet cell sponges in it so that they are really wet. And then we just basically paint the surface of the eye on the cornea where there is squamous neoplasia and we let it sit for maybe five seconds and the epithelium turns a little bit gray in color and then it helps when we scroll it off. We think it denatures the cells, but it also loosens the adhesions uh, to the basement membrane. Um, Dr. Carroll, do, do you advise? Uh, fortunately, we don't have as uh, many as uh, conjunctival melanoma. Uh, still, we have some surprises. So do you advise, advise our resident to deal with every uh, conjunctival lesion as the suspicious and do the non-touch technique in, in case of pigmented or non-pigmented? Yeah, so for, say you have a patient who has a melanocytic lesion and it has cysts in it, and you think it might be a nevus. I mean, that certainly can be watched or can be surgically removed. You know, if it's pigmented, patient, families tend to want it removed. And I say families because it's usually found in kids. If it's non-pigmented, they're okay with watching it. When we remove it, we generally use the no-touch technique. We just use that for every conjunctival tumor we deal with, just in case you're fooled. It's not much more difficult than just, you know, it, it's not that much more difficult just handling the normal tissue surrounding it. So I think in your uh, population, you're not going to see much melanoma. You may see nevi, you may see more, I think, complexion related melanosis, but not as much melanoma as we see in the States. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Michelle, I think. Is interferon alpha 2A is equally effective to as uh, 2B? Great question. Uh, most of us who use interferon use interferon alpha 2B. So I think in the past, uh, Carol Karp's team has investigated pegylated interferon and non-pegylated interferon. And I even think they found like there's no great difference, but I really can't comment on in, in, interfere on alpha 2A. Thank you. And so if it's not available, we'll go for the second line. Yeah, I would go, I would, I would do your own study, right? I would do your own study and see what your results are if you only have interfere on alpha 2A. Great. Um, the, the, one, the one medication I didn't talk much about was topical 5-FU, and I, I have to give it credit. Topical 5-FU for ocular surface squamous neoplasia could be a game changer for your patients. Why? Because it's 
cheap, um, it works fast, and it's not as, top, not as uh, toxic as mitomycin C. So more and more, I've been recommending 5-FU. We still like interferon, but 5-FU, if it's a patient that I get a sense doesn't want to be on it for three months, I say, okay, we can use 5-FU, and you're, you're only on it for a week. Great. Uh, there's a question about uh, your strategy in treating sebaceous cell carcinoma. Yeah, we sort of went through that. Sebaceous carcinoma is a terrible disease, and it requires long-term, ongoing mo uh, monitoring. But what we do is we take out the main tumor, even if it is the entire upper lid. And we don't do what's called lumpectomy, just to remove what looks like a little chalazium. We do posterior lamellar anatomic dissection. So we always make the incision on the front of the lid just above the lashes, and we take out the entire posterior lamella because you're gonna get your best results. We actually published this in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, I think it was two years ago. We compared lumpectomy versus posterior lamellar anatomic dissection for sebaceous carcinoma. And those that had the posterior lamellar dissection, not one of them needed exoneration, and they had significantly better outcomes. You're taking out more tissue, but you're not missing the skips and the little residuals that are hiding in the lid. Great, and do you recommend biopsy before this uh, lamellectomy? Um, yeah, you could do a biopsy. A lot of patients come to us with a biopsy already done. Okay. So we like to do an incisional biopsy. Know, know that we're dealing with sebaceous carcinoma. Have you, the pathologist, confirm it. And then we proceed with our posterior lamellar resection. Okay, there's a question from uh, Dr. Khaled Al-Malki. Uh, when do you usually expect response after rituximab? and how the recurrence compared to other modal modalities of treatment? So <clears throat> basically, I like to think of lymph lymphoid tumors, our management of lymphoid tumors in two categories. Are we going to manage the patient locally, or are we going to manage them systemically? And our local treatments include surgical resection or external beam radiotherapy. And our systemic treatments will be systemic chemotherapy or rituximab. So if a patient has systemic disease, we would use systemic chemotherapy or rituximab, and we usually use it for uh, four months, and then we reassess. Uh, the local therapies is if the patient has unilateral disease and no systemic involvement, then we'll use either surgical resection or radiotherapy. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's lots of questions. I don't know for how long you, <laughs> you can continue with us. Uh, um, is interferon injected into subcutaneous tumor or subconjunctivally? Uh, wow. Yeah. So um, the Italians in Rome have done uh, work on injection of interferon where they actually inject it under the tumor uh, for lymphoma and gotten good results. Um, when we use interferon, we don't necessarily inject it for lymphoma. We use interferon for squamous neoplasia and we'll inject it directly under the tumor. So it can be used for ocular surface squamous neoplasia or lymphoma. We don't use it that much for lymphoma because we prefer more rituximab, because I just want to make sure the body is completely clean. Uh, Thank you. Hello, Dr. Shields. May I ask a question? It's Dr. Diego Strianese. Hello. Where are you, where are you calling Hi. from? Uh, no, now I'm in Riyadh. I'm in Kekesh now. Okay, so. excellent. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, yes, just, <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, just one question. Uh, how do you address normally the lympho nodes? I mean, do you use this? That's, of course, uh, either for uh, sebaceous uh, cell carcinoma or even for melanoma. Do you normally do ultrasound, uh, echo color Doppler? Do you, know, do you assess with the uh, biopsy in case there is an involvement? Yeah. So the question is how do we check for lymph nodes with various malignancies? Uh, yeah. So we. 
we have a team of uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors, general oncologists, melanoma oncologists, and general oncologists, and facial plastic surgeons. And we send all of our patients, we advise all of our patients with conjunctival melanoma and eyelid malignancies, including sebaceous carcinoma and Merkel cell carcinoma and cutaneous melanoma to see the sentinel lymph node biopsy team for potential, potential sentinel lymph node biopsy. We don't use sentinel lymph node biopsy for conditions that don't generally spread there. Like, uh, for example, ocular surface squamous neoplasia would, wouldn't need a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But conj melanoma, lid melanoma, lid sebaceous carcinoma, lid Merkel cell carcinoma, all are visited by this team. And we use uh, the lymph node biopsy to assess the sentinel node. And if the sentinel node is positive, then the next line of nodes are removed. And if we find that further involvement is found, they may even get radiotherapy. Let me just discuss a case that we recently saw. It was a patient who had a very highly malignant mucoepidermoid squamous cell carcinoma who came to see us uh, from London and she had the whole back of her lid was involved and she had a positive node. So we did a posterior lamellar resection for the back of her lid. We were worried this was sebaceous carcinoma and it proved to be a different type of tumor, but equally malignant. And then we had our facial sentinel lymph node team take off that node and the whole line of nodes in her neck. And then she got radiotherapy to, her, to the lymph nodes in her neck. Hopefully we've prevented her from ever having recurrence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, Dr. Carol, there's a question from Dr. Reem. Uh, can we consider amniotic membrane to cover the defect after OSS and removal? I think this was a part of your uh, video. Is it right? Yes. So, yes, we do. So, we use amniotic membrane grafting quite a bit in our practice. Um, I like to tell our fellows, it's much more often necessary medially than temporally. Temporally, you have lots of good tissue up in the fornix that you can pull down to cover. But medially, you don't have a lot of tissue to share. So we often have to graft medially. Now, when we put an amniotic membrane graft down after any type of surgery, whether it's a melanoma or squamous neoplasia or whatever, we always first close tenon's fascia. So we close tenon's fascia. Why do we do this? We don't want the membrane to stick to the sclera. Why, why not? Well, if it sticks to the sclera, you may have motility problems because it's sticking to the muscle. You, it'll be more difficult to dissect if you have a recurrence. So we like to bring tenon's fascia back and reconstruct the normal anatomic tenons fascia, then epithelium. So we close tenons, good, strong, vicral sutures. We like to use 70 vicral. And then we place the graft on top of tenons. And we always put cardinal sutures in. I know a lot of cornea people just glue without cardinal sutures, and that's fine. But, you know, we just don't want to have the graft slough. So we put cardinal sutures in. And then we glue with tissue glue, I like to use to seal, under the graft, and then we put a layer of glue on the surface of the eye over the graft, and that's for patient comfort. Under the graft is to stick the graft down. Over the graft is for patient comfort. Yes, we use amniotic membrane a lot. And there's two types. There's a freeze-dried and a frozen type. Um, you know, at Wills, we tend to have the frozen type. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from Dr. Uh... Subhash, any correlation between the actinic keratosis and eyelids uh, of eyelids and OSSN? So um, I would highly suspect that there is a correlation. You know, when a patient comes in to see us with OSSN, uh, first thing I do is I turn the lights on in the room and I look at their forehead, their skin, and their hands. Because at least in the U.S., that's where most people show actinic keratosis. And I don't want to miss one of those. So I, I always, and sometimes you can feel it. It feels like sandpaper on the skin. So it's important to be, you know, a full doctor to, you know, check your patient's skin. If they have OSSN on the eye, 
check their skin and hands to make sure they don't have actinic keratosis there. Excellent. Uh, there's a question from Vanessa. Can we use 70% alcohol if we don't have 100% uh, for OSSN? Yeah, I think that would probably be a good substitute. I think 70% is probably just as favorable as 100%. And if you don't have alcohol, it's not a big deal. I mean, you can always, especially in your elderly patient, you can always remove that epithelium. It's, it's sometimes a little more difficult in younger patients. So for example, if I'm re removing a limbal nevus from a 10-year-old, I won't use alcohol at all. I will just really take a little bit of epithelium from the limbus just to be sure I have all the tumor out. But if it's a, an 80 year old with OSSN, I will apply the alcohol because I want to make sure I get all the OSSN off. 70% is fine. Thank you. Great, thank you. This is a great lecture. I have one question. Uh, would you still use rituximab for CD20 negative lymphomas? Yeah, so would we use rituximab for CD20 negative lymphoma? Uh, probably not. So we always check the markers on our lymphoma, and some of them will not have CD20. So rituximab is really geared towards CD20 positive lymphoma, so we would not. And I would have to discuss this with our lymphoma oncologist. They have lots of uh, good medications that they can use, so they would probably switch it up for another alternative. And same topic, Dr. Shields, uh, Dr. Uh, Parapati is asking, do you prefer rituximab even there's no systemic lymphoma? We also talked that over with the lymphoma oncologist. If there's no systemic lymphoma, we tend to just locally treatment, give local treatment to the eye. That would be either surgical resection or surgical resection plus low-dose radiotherapy. But if the patient has really big conj and orbital lymphoma and we are a little bit worried that it's so large that they may have systemic lymphoma, we might give them four cycles of rituximab. So, so uh, it, a lot of it depends on maybe the size and location. If there's orbital involvement, we lean a little more to rituximab. So. Little, little lymphoid processes on the eye, no, not rituximab. Uh, big processes, we lean a little more towards it. Great. I have a question. You mentioned about the invasive squamous cell carcinoma, which is invading the sclera and the cornea. We do the plaque therapy, and yes. we don't inoculate anymore. What about if ultrasound shows that there's extensive invasion? Of course, we, at this stage, we go for inoculation, or still we can do the plaque. No, you are correct, Dr. Maktabi. Uh, so if there's extensive invasion and there's, you know, retinal detachment and it's, you know, it's more than a 15 millimeter base that's invaded into the eye, you probably have to enucleate. <clears throat> the type that we irradiate are generally focal areas like a quarter of the cornea, uh, or maybe 10 millimeters or less. I mean, there are some that we can actually measure the intraocular component with ultrasound biomicroscopy. And even those, we still irradiate. So we published on uh, plaque radiotherapy for uh, scleroinvasive uh, squamous cell carcinoma a few years ago. The lead author was Arapelli. And um, we found an 15 consecutive cases, we were able to save the eye in 15 consecutive cases. Uh, but again, these were focal. If it's all over the place, no, you have to remove the eye. Thank you. Uh, is there any role of exentration in these cases when there's extensive uh, invasion? Yeah, for squamous cell carcinoma or squamous neoplasia? Squamous. Yeah. yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, it's fairly rare to see squamous neoplasia invade into the orbit. We have seen it. Um, basically, we have seen it in patients who were immunosuppressed. I'll never forget, uh, we had a, a man who was a liver transplant. He had a little lesion at his limbus. I thought, this is you know not too challenging. I removed it. Everything was fine. Wouldn't you know, he came back with massive orbital invasion, and he... Uh, needed exoneration. Now, nowadays, 
I would send the squamous neoplasia for biomarkers, looking for epithelial growth factors, because now we have medications designed against these epithelial growth factor receptors, so like Tarceva. So I would, before exoneration's done, I would have the pathologist send it, basically when we send it for biomarkers, we send it to a company that does all the biomarkers. Um, one company is called Foundation One. So you can ask your general oncologist what company they use for biomarkers and just use the same company. And basically they want you to send like 10 slides of the patient's tumor and they'll run it against 500 biomarkers. And if it proves that this squamous neoplasia has a couple of biomarkers that have already medications designed against, you may be able to save that patient from exoneration. That's basically how the oncologists do it. Great, thank you. Um, and we use, found, we use Foundation One. It's, it's, a great, it's a great company. And basically they give you a printout and they'll say, okay, the tumor on patient so-and-so was run against 500 biomarkers. These five were positive, And these are the medications that are helpful for these five biomarkers. And they'll give you references too. I mean, it's amazing what they do. You can check them out online. Go, go look up Foundation One. Okay, great. Uh, there are more questions coming, <laughs> popping up. Are you re ready for more? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for more. You can help me answer these. You know, you know the answers. <laughs> yeah, okay. And Maria, so, those two, I see Maria there. Yeah. So uh, one, uh, Dr. Beatty is asking, out of 5-FU and interferon for OSSN, which one scores better? Per, that's a wonderful question. So um, my good friend, Carol Karp, she and I share a lot together. And both of us used to say interferon with no hesitation. But now Carol Karp is saying 5-FU um, because of the cost and the quickness. And I am a, maybe a little more slow to transition. I like interferon because patients are happy. They never complain. Um, so, and interferon is easy to inject. So here's my feeling. If I have a patient who uh, doesn't seem to have, you know, a lot of funds and is on a tight budget, I'll put them on 5-FU for one week. And I tell them to come back and see me in a month and bring the med with them. If they look like they have a lot of funds or they have very advanced disease, I will inject them and put them on interferon. I don't like to inject 5-FU. Uh, I know some people will inject it. I just don't think we have enough information out there for injection of 5-FU. Great. Um, how you manage OSS in infants with zero derma pigmentosa conditions? This is from Dr. Sheikh. Yeah, sure. I would get them on interferon as soon as a tumor is found, and I'd keep them on interferon. So we have a life. Couple, yeah, I'd keep them on interferon. So I would start them, if they have a squamous neoplasia, I'd start them on interferon QID. And if it doesn't go away, I would inject and balloon up the squamous neoplasia. I do not want to put kids on 5-FU or mitomycin C. It's a hard drug for kids to use. So I would exhaust interferon in kids, starting out with topical. And if it didn't work, I'd go to injection, just like I showed that one little boy from India, how beautifully injection worked for him. And then I'd keep the child, because they have this predisposition, I'd keep them on one drop a day, interferon. Because I do, we do believe it prevents. We, we have a number of uh, organ transplant patients and patients with xeroderma pigmentosum who are on topical interferon once a day. They have no long-term side effects. They might get a little tiny follicular conjunctivitis, which is asymptomatic to them. But that's the immune system getting juiced up to fight the HPV. Great. Uh, back and forth between interferon and 5-FU, someone, uh, Dr. Uh, Kotisha, asked how many cycles of 5-FU we can give? Yeah. So we usually start, it's a little different than, with mitomycin, we do 
mitomycin 0.04% QID on week one, nothing on week two, then back on mitomycin for week three and nothing for week four. Then we asked them to come see us on week five. For 5-FU, we put them on 5-FU 1% on week one QID, nothing on week two, three, and four, and come back and see us on week five. For interferon, we put them on interferon, 1 million units per cc topical for week one all the way to week 12. And then we tell them, come back and see us in three months. So we see the, the more toxic meds in one month and the less toxic med interferon in three months. Great. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Al-Amir. Do you recommend uh, prescribing topical steroids in addition to 5-FU? Um, not really. Generally, on the weeks that our patients are off those toxic medicines, mitomycin C or 5-FU, we give them erythromycin. We just say, you can. this is very soothing to the eye. You can use this. If they need a topical steroid antibiotic, I guess you could use it. On the weeks they're off. You really don't want anything to interfere with that 5-FU. You want it to get to the epithelium. So if you use any med, especially an ointment, while they're on the topical med, you're going to inhibit that med from getting to the epithelium. True. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jildawi is asking, is there a difference in success rate between the melanocytic versus amelanotic melanoma? And is there a difference in the success rate in treatment between melanotic and non-melanotic or amelanotic melanomas? That's a good question. Um, amelanotic melanoma is less common, and it can be very, very difficult to diagnose clinically because it's misdiagnosed as everything that's amelanotic until someone does a biopsy. And we've had patients uh, come to see us from long distances who've had it all over the surface of their eye by the time it was <clears throat> diagnosed. So I think it's more difficult to treat because you can't see it as well. Whereas with melanotic melanoma or pigmented melanoma, you can see it or you can see the PAM when it's coming back. But there's a, a melanotic melanoma can arise from PAM sine pigmento. It's a melanotic PAM, and you can't see it. So those patients, the way we manage them is we do map biopsy on the surface of the eye, and we cryo the whole surface of the eye, generally once a year for a few years or every six months for a few years, just to get rid of any a melanotic PAM. You can't see it. So we do map biopsies on the ball bar, Fornicil and even the tarsal conge and just cryo everything or the other alternative if they've had a lot of recurrences is we'll put a radioactive conformer plaque on the surface of the eye unshielded so it irradiates to the tarsus and to the ball bar conge uh, to get rid of amelanotic PAM or melanoma but we only do that if a patient's had multiple recurrences. I think checkpoint inhibitors, if I nowadays, if I had a patient with amelanotic melanoma, it might be a good idea to put them on four or six months of checkpoint inhibitors and see if you can reverse it. There's more and more out there about checkpoint inhibitors. I've seen nodular melanoma the size of my thumb on the tarsal conjunctiva completely disappear with checkpoint inhibitors right. for melanoma. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Dr. al -Abbasi. Can we still apply topical cyclosporine or uh, trecholimus in patients with OSSN or had previously OSSN? Well, I've never used cyclosporine or tacrolimus. So um, I know that there are some other concoctions uh, for in combination uh, to treat OSSN, but we've never used those medications. We basically just have, we basically have four medications. We use either mitomycin C, but not much anymore. 5-FU, maybe for those who don't have much money. Interferon, a lot. Cydofovir, which is an antiviral, almost never. The only people we use that in is if someone has had multiple recurrences from the other three, we might 
put them on topical cidofovir in hopes it might work. Okay, one more question from Dr. Bendahil. He said, when to use 5-FU for five months and when to extend it uh, to more than, more than that? Example, in corneal involvement uh, smokers. And for how long we should uh, continue topical therapy after complete resolution of OSSN? Oh, both good questions. So for 5-FU, we use it one week on, three weeks off. If the patient still has disease, when he comes to see us, we do another course, one week on, three weeks off. So, I mean, your risk with 5-FU and mitomycin C, if it's used for a prolonged period of time, is you might get necrosis at some point on the surface of the eye. And I have seen that with mitomycin C. A gentleman, you know, nearby in Pennsylvania was treated with nine consecutive cycles of topical mitomycin C. And by the time he came to see us, his conjunctiva and his sclera had a big hole in it. He, we had to patch graft him. So you don't want to overuse these. So I would say 5-FU, if a patient hasn't responded by three cycles of 5-FU, I would consider something else. Now, how long do we consider, how long do we continue treatment after a patient has had complete response? I would say maybe one, one more cycle. At least we give one more cycle of interferon. If a patient's shown complete response for 5-FU and mitomycin C, I might consider one more cycle or just watching them because they're toxic. Great. Uh, Dr. Beatty is asking interferon eye drops. Do you dilute them with anything and how they are dispensed? Yeah, I'd have to resort to our pharmacy, and I'm sure our pharmacy. Uh, can tell you exactly, well, we've written this in our papers, uh, exactly how we prepare them. <clears throat> it is 1 million units per cc, and I think it's diluted in BSS, balanced salt solution, but I'm not 100% sure, and they come in a little uh, drop dropper bottle, and they have to be refrigerated because they are very sensitive to heat, and you can't shake them, they're very unstable. And I'll, I'll let you know something that I do think is really important. Here in the States, there are companies that you can buy interferon topical drops from, and they send it to you through mail. It's their, their, their um, pharmacies. One's called Lighter, L-E-I-T-E-R, and the other one is called, let me just see if I can get my, uh, contacts open they can ship overseas i don't know if they do but one is called lighter pharmacy and it's www.lighter l-e-i-t-e-r dot com and the other one is uh yeah avilia pharmacy and i only have their their i think in arizona and they ship interferon too. And the problem with these, and their number is 877, it's an American number, 877-546-5779. Um, the problem with these companies is they ship them. And by the time they get shipped, they're bouncing around in an airplane or whatever, and they may be less effective by the time they see you. And we're not 100% sure they're shipping them properly. So sometimes when a patient says, oh, I've been on interferon for four months and my tumor's not going away, I ask them, did you get your medicine shipped to you or did you have it prepared at our pharmacy? And most of the time it was shipped to them. So I would recommend that you have your pharmacist prepare it. And I think KCash is a big enough institution that your pharmacy can be preparing their own interferon. And if you have, Dr. Aza, any question on how it's prepared, I can put you in direct contact with our outpatient pharmacy and they can tell you how they prepare it. Highly appreciate it, thank you. That would be very helpful. And how they prepare the injections too. Because interferon is a relatively unstable medication. So you have to prepare it and put it in a refrigerated setting without shaking it. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Carl Shields, as we all know that squamous cell carcinoma is rare in eyelids and uh, most of the cases we have seen it, it 
there's some conjunctival involvements. So how, even by histopathological, so how we could uh, manage to uh, decide is this is started in the eyelids or this is started in the conjunctiva and vice versa? Yeah, does that's it all. Matter, does it matter in, in the management? So, um, you know, it's, it, at least in the States, it's a little bit unusual to see in the eyelids, but we do see it in the eyelids. And the good news, here's a good news, uh, we have used injection interferon for these patients, and I have seen cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma disappear over several weeks just with injection of interferon. This is why you need to have interferon nearby. I even know uh, people who use injection interferon to treat basal cell carcinoma. Uh, there's a team in Columbia, South America, uh, that are treating basal cell carcinoma with injection of interferon. I've used it once or twice and it has worked. Um, so whether it originates on the conjunctiva or most, most conjunctival squamous neoplasia originates in sun exposed areas at like three and nine o'clock on the surface of the eye at the limbus. So if you have one that's kind of on the lid and on the conj, it probably originated in the lid because that would be a rare place for squamous cell carcinoma of the conj to originate. But I would, I would rec highly recommend that you first consider, after you do a biopsy to confirm it, consider an injection of interferon and see what happens. Great, great, thank you. I see here Dr. Khaled Al-Malki, he shared with us the uh, website of the Avilia. Okay, good. Yeah, thank Avilia. You. And there, yeah, there's a question from Dr. Bendekhil. He's asking, in your experience, what's the shortest course of topical treatment for us? The shortest course of topical treatment, it would either be with uh, 5-FU or mitomycin C. And if I had to pick one, I would pick 5-FU because it's much, much less, less expensive. And it seems to, it's a lower concentration and patients tolerate it better. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Omar Abbasi, can you ask your question directly to Dr. Carol, please? I think I misunderstand uh, his question. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Azza. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ka, uh, Shil, for this uh, informative lecture. I was asking about the typical cyclosporine. I mean, is it safe to use it not as treatment, but we know that it is typical immunosuppressive and it's, I don't know if it's considered as a risk factor for us in itself. So some patient like PKC or any ocular inflammatory surface, we use cyclosporine or tacrolimus. Is it safe to still use it in patient who had history of us and or he's having us? And I mean, is it isn't it as a risk factor for recurrence or? Yeah. So you know, I I really don't know, but I I can maybe extrapolate to something else. Um, a few years ago, we published on a series of patients who had corneal grafts and they were on chronic topical steroids. And we thought the chronic topical immunosuppression from steroids led to the development of the HPV related squamous neoplasia. So, you know, um, I would think any immunosuppressant could pose a little bit of a risk, but honestly, I can't speak directly to cyclosporin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bidi is asking, first she's thanking you for your uh, outstanding lecture, and she's asking if, the, if you can share your email ID for later guidance, guidance and help. I think you have your uh, consult email. Yeah, sure. You can share um, so we have, um, there's two different ways to send it. One would be to send to consults, is it consults at shields? MD. Uh, let me just pull this up and I can find the exact one. I don't send myself emails, so that's, yeah. it's consults, C-O-N-S-U-L-T-S at shields.md. That's probably the best way to get in touch with us. Great. Uh, actually, I don't want this to come to an end. Uh, it was very valuable and uh, rich speech with uh, an outstanding uh, expert in the field. I'm so honored to be your ex-fellow uh, and to moderate uh, this uh, talk. So uh, I think um, that was wonderful.
helpful and I hope that you can uh, accept our invitation uh, later. Thank you, Dr. Maktabi. It has, this has been a pleasure and a great honor to uh, be speaking to you and all your team there at KCASH and all the other viewers um, on this uh, webinar. It was uh, well organized and it seemed to go uh, be very interactive. And we have people from all over. We have friends from Boston, friends from Chile, friends from all over. This is great. We're all working together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, back there yeah. too. Yep. And Dr. Jerry Shields would like to say hello too. Hi, Dr. Jerry. How are you? Maria, how you doing, kid? <laughs> great. Good, Good to see you. Good yeah. to see you, Dr. Jerry. He, li he listened to the talk and he um, uh, learned a lot and <laughs> he wants to thank everyone for working together. <laughs> good. good. All right. Okay. So we'll be signing off. You guys have a, a good uh, afternoon. We'll have a good morning. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Aza, keep in touch, okay? Sure. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>